to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. 3 John verse 4. Welcome to our study of the books of 2 and 3 John. In our previous two lessons, we noted that the book of 1 John teaches us about walking in the light, chapters 1 and 2, and then walking in love, chapters 3 through 5. God is light, therefore we must live our life according to that light, that truth. God is love, 1 John 4 verse 8, therefore we must walk in love, live a life that's motivated by love. Now 2 and 3 John complement that theme by teaching us that we must walk in the truth. You know, when we think about the idea of walk, that suggests to us that we've got to practice by our lifestyle. That is, our life must be lived according to the light, our life must be lived according to love, and our life must be lived according to truth. In fact, the word truth is a key word in the books of 2nd and 3rd John. This word occurs 11 times in 26 verses. It's a repetitive word. What does it mean, though, to walk in truth? Well, what is truth? Pilate asked that in John 18, verse 36. Here are some things we can know are truth. Psalm 119, 172, the Bible says, All of God's commandments are true and righteous. And so we're talking about the commands of God. John 17, verse 17, I want you to notice this verse. Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. And notice he explains that. Your word is truth. And so we've got the commandments of God. We've got the word of God. Ephesians 4 verse 21 says the truth is in Jesus. Jesus himself is the epitome of truth. God as well. John 8 verse 32, we're told, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so we've got that truth which is in Jesus, the Word of God, God Himself, all of that compiled to teach us that we've got to live our life by the teaching of the Bible, by the example of God and Jesus. That's what it really means to walk in the truth. Now, let's let 2 and 3 John explain to us just how to do that. According to 2 John, how does a person walk in truth? You first of all must love in truth. I want you to notice 2 John verse 1. The Bible says in 2 John verse 1 to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth and not only I but also all those who have known the truth. To walk in truth you've got to love in truth. What does it mean to, to love in truth? That is your motives for what you're doing has to be true. Ephesians 4 verse 15 Gospel preachers and anyone who speaks the Word of God are told to speak the truth in love. That's not the sense that everything we say has to be flowery and flowing um, with sugar, but rather the idea that our motives in preaching the gospel must be the love of people's souls. We talk about loving in truth. We're talking about loving according to true standards, the Word of God. John 17, verse 17, I have a true motive, that is love for the lost. I have a standard which is true by which I post the guidelines, the boundaries in my life. And it also means when we love in truth, you've got true teaching. John 7, verse 17, Jesus said, If anyone wants to know his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether I speak of myself or if it's from God. You can know true teaching by testing it. Matthew 17, 5, the teaching of Jesus is most definitely true, for God's voice came down from heaven, this, on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, hear him. But friends, you've also got to have true love. To walk in truth and love in truth, love has to be that motivation by which we do all things. What's the greatest commandment? The greatest commandment ever. What is it? Jesus defined that in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, following. 
A lawyer came to Jesus and he asked him that very question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And here's what Jesus said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with my, all your mind and all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. Love for God is what it means to walk in truth. We've got to let love be the motivating factor. God loved me enough to send His Son into the world. And when I love in truth and walk in truth, I'm motivated by that to live according to the gospel. Now it's important that we walk in truth because it's the truth that is going to abide forever. Friend, when you're living your life by the truth, you're living your life by something that is not fleeting, that's not passing, that's not a fad. You're living your life by something that is a constant, something that you can always be sure of regardless of the age or the time or the social climate. You know, when we talk about things that are truth, we can surely know that the Word of God is truth. I want you to notice what John says about this idea of truth abiding forever. Notice 2 John verse 2. The Bible says, because of the truth which abides in us, and notice, and will be with us forever. What, what are things that we know are going to exist forever? We can know that God is. Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's the idea that God is from everlasting to everlasting, that Jesus existed before the creation of the world. And so, as a constant truth that will abide forever, we have first of all God. Secondly, we can know that the Word of God is a truth that will abide forever. Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will never pass away. The word of God is going to last the test of time. And friend, here's another thing you can know will abide forever. The souls of men are going to last beyond this life. This is what makes it real important. If I'm going to have that truth and abide forever with God and by the word of God, then I've got to realize my soul is the most important thing I have. Every person, listen carefully, every person has an eternal soul that is going to live beyond this life in either heaven, that place of wonderful joy and happiness, or hell, that place Jesus described as a lake of fire. And it is dependent upon your relationship with God based on the Word of God as to where you go in eternity. And so when we talk about the truth that's going to abide forever, how desperately we need to make sure that we're living our life by that truth. Second John also teaches us that there's a great joy in walking according to the truth. When I live my life by the Word of God, there is a joy that you can't compare with with anything else in the world. Notice what John says in Second John verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Now notice verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. Based on the grace, the mercy, and the love of God, we've received the truth, verse 3, and now John says, I rejoice greatly when I saw some of my children walking in truth. Friend, walking in the truth is where you'll find real joy. Joy is not found in making a name for yourself. Joy is not found in wealth and fame. Joy is not really found in pleasures, not a lasting joy. True joy that transcends this temporary is found by walking in the truth. How do we know that? Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 4 that we are to rejoice always. And again I say rejoice. How could he say that? Because he had already decided for me to depart and go with, be with Christ is far better. Philippians 1 verse 21. In Acts chapter 16 verse 25, Paul and uh, Silas or Paul and Barnabas are there in prison and they're praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners are listening to them. How could they be happy in a situation like that? They'd already decided whatever the case, whether they stayed or whether they died and went on, they were going to be with the Lord. Matthew 5, verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And do you remember who the happy person is, according to Psalm 1? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the, seat of the, or in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But blessed or happy is the man whose delight 
is in the law of the Lord. And so we need to know that real joy, real happiness comes by living your life according to the truth. Friend, I can promise you this. You'll never have any real joy until you decide to get your life right with God. And you'll never experience any greater joy than knowing that you're living according to the Bible. Knowing that no matter what happens, all is well with you and God is the most amazing joy you can ever have. Now when we talk about walking in the truth, I want to illustrate for you how that means that we don't just, we don't just have the truth in our life, but we've got to do something to walk in truth. For example, walking in truth means that we've got to practice what we believe and what we say. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, Paul said, I beseech you, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. There's the idea of walking in truth. Every day I've got to give myself as a sacrifice to God in the truth. Philippians 4 verse 9, Paul said, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. And so we practice the truth. When we talk about practicing the truth, though, it also means that we must exemplify. That is, the truth must be seen as an example in our life. Think of the words of Jesus in Matthew 5 verse 16. Jesus said that we've got to be a light unto the world an example to those around us. He said, you don't take a, a lamp and put it under a basket. A city set on a hill can be seen by everyone. And Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When I'm walking in the truth, people should be able to see by my lifestyle that I'm following the teaching of God. I'm to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. Like those in Acts 4, verse 13, people ought to be able to see Jesus living in me. And so I practice the truth. I live it out in my life. I exemplify it. But it also means I've got to defend the truth. Jude, verse 3, Jude said, I wanted to write to you concerning our common salvation. However, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. Walking in the truth means I stand up and stand four square for the truth, and that means against error. 1 Peter 3, verse 15, we're told to be ready always, to give a ready reason defense of the reason of the hope that's within us. You know, it also means when we're walking in the truth that we've got to be ready to spread the gospel. You can't walk in truth and not want to share that truth with others. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18. Go into all the world, Preach the gospel unto every creature. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And He said to His disciples as He looked out on the crowd in Matthew 9, verse 36, He said, Truly, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. You pray the Lord of hosts that He'll send laborers into His field. Well, who are those laborers? Who is the field? The lost world is the field. Christians are the laborers and we must spread the message of God. Now John also notes in 2 John verses 7 and 8 that to walk in truth you've got to recognize false teachers and false teaching. When we think about walking in truth we've got to have the mindset that yes I want to stand for the truth but I also want to stand against that which is error. Notice verses 7 and 8. John says for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Many deceivers, John says, have gone out into the world. We've got to recognize there is error. Romans 16 verse 17 commands us to mark those who teach doctrines that are contrary to Christ. 1 John 4 verses 1 through 4 says we've got to test to the spirits to see whether they have God for many false prophets or false teachers have gone out into the world. We've got to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21 and so we need to be aware there is error, there are false teachers. Anybody can know this. Look back through history and you'll see people who claim to be great servants of God. Many of them made an appeal for money and find out 
those people were false teachers. They were living uh, luxuriously based on others' funds that they sent in. Uh, those who were sheeps or wolves in sheep's clothing, they were in error. They were not doing right. They were living immorally, and they were not walking in truth nor teaching it. And so we've got to be ready to stand up against error. But here's the key to it all. We've got to do this because we must realize that if a person goes beyond the teaching of Jesus, he's not in a relationship with God anymore. Friend, I want you to see how severe it is to depart from the teaching of Christ. Look at 2 John verses 9 through 11. Notice the severity of not teaching correctly. The Bible says, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. The person who's teaching error has no longer, no longer has a relationship with God. That is a sin and it has severed their relationship with God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us our sins separate us from a loving and holy God. And so someone says, well, you know, I understand what you're saying. And I've heard people maybe where I'm at say things that I don't agree with. But is that really that important? It is. And here's why. They no longer have God as their father. They're not teaching right. And they are the blind leading the blind. They're leading people down the path of error. And so walking in truth means that I must stay true to the doctrine of Christ. And I've got to beware of false teachers and make sure that I don't get caught up in their false teaching. Now, as we think about this, I want you to notice also in 3 John, walking in truth also means that our main goal in life is not physical prosperity, but spiritual prosperity. I want you to notice what John says in 3 John 2. This is a, a beautiful statement made by John to uh, Gaius. And notice what he says here. This shows John's real focus. John says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Oh, he wanted him to be in good health. He wanted him to have prosperity. But first and foremost, he needed Gaius to know your soul is what's really important. Walking in truth means that I realize the most valuable possession I have is my soul and it's my one main priority. That's what Jesus taught. Remember the questions of Jesus in Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37? Jesus said, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's say you've got all the wealth in the world and you haven't lived your life right. And you get to God and you say, Well, God, I haven't really done right, but look what I brought with me. Wouldn't you like to have some of that? What's that going to account? Nothing. The main thing in this life is you making your soul right with God. That's why 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, test yourselves, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the truth. And so your soul is the most important thing. Spiritual prosperity is our main goal. Let's make sure that we're walking in truth and that we're growing as we ought to. How do you make your soul prosper? Well, one of the ways you do that is by growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. One of the ways you do that is by being like a newborn babe and desiring the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. We do that by studying to show ourselves approved unto God. And when we study, when we learn, when we acquire knowledge, then we practice that. We walk in the truth. And so is your soul prospering? Are you walking according to the truth? Now, walking according to the truth also means that those who are children of God must be hospitable toward fellow workers in evangelism. This is one of John's main points in 3 John that he makes to Gaius. He says, if you're going to walk in truth and you're going to be a friend of the truth, you need to help fellow workers as they spread the gospel. And one of the ways you can do that is by being hospitable. Notice 3 John verses 5 through 8. The Bible says, 
Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. Notice, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Because they went out for His name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such notice that we may become fellow workers for the truth. How was Gaius going to become a fellow worker for the truth? Well, he needed to be evangelistic himself, no doubt about that. But being hospitable, helping out, providing uh, funds, providing ease, providing a, a place to stay even for evangelist, that was one of the ways he could help in the cause of Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 1, that we're to let brotherly love continue, that we are to be hospitable towards strangers. Think about the journeys of Paul and the journeys of Peter. How would it have worked if Paul hadn't have found Christians to stay with, if he hadn't have found people along the way to help him. He wouldn't have had a very good reception in some areas. He wouldn't have been able to go as far as he did. If we want to be fellow workers, if we want to walk in the truth, hospitality is one of the ways that we can do that. You know, it's almost an unheard of thing today. Uh, people being invited into homes as often, helping those who come to stay in an area, evangelists and things of that nature. But it is a biblical way in which we ourselves can spread the gospel. Now, I want you to notice this, though. In 3 John, verses 9 and 10, we are now going to be introduced to an individual who was definitely not walking in the truth. Diotrephes is his name, and notice what the problem was in 3 John 9. The Bible says, I wrote to the church... But Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content with that. He himself does not receive the brethren, forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. What's the problem with diatrophies here? They're trying to do evangelism. They're trying to walk in the truth in a context dealing with receiving evangelists and helping be fellow workers. What is diatrophies doing? Diotrephes wants to have first place. He is not allowing those who say they're a part of the body of Christ from other areas it looks like. He's not allowing people to help them. He wants to rule the roost and have everything under his control. He's the opposite of 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 5. Peter said elders are not to be lords, or leaders are not to be lords over the flock. And it looks like Diotrephes is trying to do just that. Diotrephes is a prideful man. Proverbs 16, verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. The problem with Diotrephes is this. In Colossians 1, verse 18, we're already told, that Christ is preeminent and that He must have first place in all things. Diotrephes wanted the preeminence, but that place only belongs to Jesus. No one else can have first place, can be preeminent, because Christ already has that place. You know, here's the problem, and you can see this in your own mind as you think about it. What's wrong with that? what Diotrephes did? Well, it was against the will of God, no doubt about it. It was sinful. But Diotrephes' actions were very contagious, led right up to the papacy. What you think about this? Diotrephes, one man, wanted to have control of everything. That led into Catholicism, where there was one bishop, not according to Scripture, Acts 14, verse 23, there were elders in every church in the New Testament, they were autonomous. But these actions led into and were contagious with the popes, the papacy, the bishops, one man ruling a group, one man ruling the whole thing? That was never God's will. The papacy isn't found in Scripture. One bishop ruling over everybody, that's not according to the will of God. First Timothy 3, there are to be elders in every congregation. Acts 14, verse 23, Peter himself was not the first pope. Acts chapter 10, verses 25 and 26, Cornelius fell down to, to worship him. And Peter said, hey, you stand up. I'm just a man. And so you can see the sinful nature of things like these. It's definitely not walking in the truth when we've got to put ourselves up there in first place when God says that's not right. In verse 11, John also tells us that walking in the truth means that we have to imitate that which is good, not that which is evil. Notice 3 John verse 11. The Bible says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. 
He who does good is of God. He who does evil has not seen God. Part of our relationship to walking in the truth means that we've got to be imitators of that which is good. Remember 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21? To find out what is good, we've got to prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Well, how do we do that? Here are some ways. First of all, if you want to imitate the good, you could find no better way of doing that than walking in the footsteps of Jesus. For to this were you called, because Christ also suffered and died, leaving us an example that we should walk in His footsteps. You want to imitate the good, have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2 verse 5. Walk in the footsteps of Jesus. You want to imitate that which is good? Do as Paul said. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Paul said, imitate me. As I imitate Christ, imitate the good character and example of men and women found in the Bible. You want to imitate that which is good? Be an example and a light to the world. Matthew 5 verse 16. And if you want to imitate the good, do as Romans 12 verse 2 says. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you want to imitate the good, transform your life to the gospel, leave sin behind, and walk in truth according to the teaching of Jesus. Third John closes out on a positive note by introducing us to another man. We've seen Gaius, he was a friend of the truth. We've seen Diotrephes, he wanted to have the preeminence and was not walking in truth. Now look at Demetrius. 3 John verse 12, notice what the text says. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself, and we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. Oh, there was a Diotrephes in that congregation. But thank God there were people like Gaius and Demetrius. Demetrius had a good testimony from all. He was a man of good reputation and he's walking according to the truth. Friend, we ask you today, are you walking according to the truth? We need to ask first of all, are you in the truth? Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a Christian? The Bible says to become a Christian, to be in the truth, to be set free by the truth, You've got to hear the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. Once you hear that Word and realize it to be God's Word, His authority for all mankind, you must believe that Jesus is God's Son, John 8, verse 24. Having believed Christ is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, you must repent. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Then you must confess Jesus before men, Romans chapter 10, verse 10, and you must be baptized in water. On the great day of Pentecost, when they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer was this, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. Are you in the truth? And are you walking according to the truth? May God help each of us to walk in truth. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. And he will reign on high forever. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1 855 458 3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. And to God be the glory, this is the gospel of Christ.